Hello, and thank you for joining us for this webinar Wednesday. My name is Sharon, and I'm with SIPA, the Statewide Internet Portal Authority. In today's webinar, Granicus will go in-depth about short-term rental compliance and enforcement. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. Please note that during this webinar, you are muted. If you have questions or would like to communicate with presenters at any point during the webinar, please use the chat box. We will try to address some questions as we go along, and we'll save time at the end of the webinar for remaining Q&A. We'll have some poll questions for you to answer as well during the presentation and appreciate your feedback. Please welcome our presenters, Graham Dempster and Betsy Sachs, who are also joined by Will Mason and Olivia Fiocchi. We would greatly appreciate their time and look forward to what they have to share. Thank you all for joining us today and take it away, Betsy and Graham. Thank you for having us. Will, I'll let you do our quick intro here. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us today for short-term rental compliance and enforcement made simple. My name is Will Mason. I'll be moderating today's program and I am joining from our Denver office. So glad to be talking to another Colorado group. Um, we can go ahead, yeah. So just to look at today's agenda, we'll do some quick welcome introductions about Granicus and our speakers today. Then we'll dive into a high level national short-term rental market overview before we start looking a little bit more into the Colorado data. Uh, and then Betsy's gonna chat a bit about our partnerships in Colorado. And we'll let Dan or Graham finish things off with a live demonstration of what host compliance actually looks like as an end user. Um, and of course, leaving time for questions at the end. So if you're not familiar with Granicus, we work with over 5,500 government agencies on everything from digital communications to online services, and really anything needed for resident engagement. Uh, that said, our host compliance solution is the trusted solution for local governments looking to solve their short-term rental compliance related challenges. So we provide everything from software, data, and guidance that empowers local authorities to see short-term rentals as the opportunity they really are. Um, and before we hop into our speaker introductions, just take a look at this quick poll here. I uh, would love to gauge the audience in terms of, uh, are you currently using a platform to uh, track or enforce regulations on short-term rentals? Leave this up for a bit while people answer and then we'll show. No, so it looks like no, we're starting from scratch here. Uh, no problem at all. I think that's a very common starting place. Manual processes and spreadsheets are, are often the place that people start when they're trying to figure out you know, what's going on in their community. Uh, so great, that's very helpful. Next slide. Yeah, now happy to introduce our, our speakers today. So Betsy, if you wouldn't mind giving us a few, few sentences. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Betsy Sachs, and I am also based in Denver, Colorado. Um, I am one of the many Colorado transplants, though. I grew up on the East Coast. I have studied uh, political science in college, and I got a master's in public policy afterwards. So I have been with Granicus for just over a year and a half now, and I've worked with our current customers here in Colorado, um, as well as new customers across the Mountain West and Central Time Zone. So a lot of varying perspectives, but hopefully I can bring some of that to the table today. Awesome, thank you, Betsy. Um, and last, but certainly not least, Graham Dempster. Thanks, Will. Uh, I'm a solutions consultant here at Granicus. I've been with the host compliance team since uh, 2018, kind of before our acquisition to Granicus. Uh, during that time, I've had the benefit of working with both new and existing customers and now get to uh, share my expertise in terms of more of a, a technical aspect for the solution. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, now I think we can hand it over to Bessie and start talking about short-term rentals at the national level. Awesome, thanks Will. So quick short-term rental market overview for anybody who is unfamiliar with the market or still learning more every single day like we are. A short-term rental is typically uh, a residential dwelling unit that is rented out for periods of less than a month, typically less than 30 days. And when you think about the short-term rental industry, you're always thinking about names like Airbnb and VRBO. Those are major players in the short-term rental game. Um, and Airbnb is the original uh, game in town. They were originally couchsurfing.com and were honestly just for people bopping around from place to place looking for 
somewhere to stay that wasn't a hotel or a motel or part of the traditional lodging industry. But simply put, the short-term rental market is exploding. The number of short-term rental listings has grown 15x since 2011, so over the last 10 plus years at this point. And in addition, the short-term rental market is now fragmenting too. So it is nearly impossible to track every single listing platform in your area. There are over a hundred different listing platforms where if I owned a short-term rental, I could be listing my property right now in Colorado. So because of this, short-term rentals are obviously becoming a growing topic of conversation. Um, we see news articles, stories about it every single day. Um, in the last year alone, there were nearly 10,000 articles that came out in publications of all shapes and sizes around North America. And we want to be tracking those because everybody has a slightly different perspective when it comes to the short-term rental industry. And short-term rentals actually accounted for a very large and constantly growing part of the lodging industry. So especially this was exacerbated with the pandemic. Um, where we actually saw 27 global markets where the home sharing industry outperformed the traditional lodging industry, hotels, motels, B&Bs. So it is growing pretty dramatically year over year. And with that growth, we're also seeing a growth in the number of complaints as well, unfortunately. So that stat on the right there shows that from 2020 to 2021, we saw an increase in party related complaints of almost 240%. And of course that number is slightly skewed because people weren't traveling nearly as much at the start of the pandemic. And it picked up really dramatically towards the end of 2021. Um, and so again, with that growth, we saw a lot of issues with short-term rentals as well, unfortunately. And the short-term rental industry as a whole is growing beyond where it was traditionally founded. It is not just in major cities and tourist destinations. It is growing in communities of all shapes and sizes around the country. You can see that Colorado here, we are obviously one of the states that has a major short-term rental presence, over 50,000 listings. But across the country, there are more than 2 million short-term rental listings and they represent over 1.6 million unique rental units. So just as a quick reminder, in case you're unfamiliar, a short-term rental unit, if I had a short-term rental, I could be listing that on multiple properties. So that's why we usually see the listings number a little bit higher than the rental units number. Graham, I'm gonna throw it over to you for this one. Yeah, and as Betsy kind of alluded to, we saw some interesting changes uh, around the time of, of the pandemic. And Probably one of the most interesting things were the early news articles that came out about this being the end of the short-term rental market. What actually ended up happening was it accelerated the market share growth of the short-term rental industry within the traditional lodging industry. And as travel started to rebound, uh, we actually saw hotels and motels struggle, whereas short-term rentals recovered a lot quicker. And that trend has continued even up until last month, Airbnb had their largest app downloads uh, in history. So people are, are staying with short-term rentals and they're not really switching back to the traditional lodging industries. And so what this means for local governments is, you know, short-term rentals can be a huge opportunity uh, where the typical traditional hotels, motels, B&Bs have contributed to the community uh, on an ongoing basis. Short-term rentals have kind of fallen off the radar a little bit until more recently. And now we can kind of see as a result of the pandemic that proactive enforcement, understanding your community's market is necessary. And it can also offset some of those uh, losses where you're not perhaps recovering that revenue that you were getting from the traditional lodging industry before. And as you're probably catching on now, the short-term rental market is nearly impossible to track manually just because there are so many different types of places and ways to list your property. People are constantly changing their listings um, and it is actually to their benefit to be constantly going in, changing their title, changing their description, changing their pictures. The algorithms on those listing platforms favor it when you're updating your listing to say, 
you know, if it's ski season, I'm going to ad advertise the fact that my property is steps from the ski resort. If it's the summer, I'm going to say that it's steps from trails. If it's close to a food and wine festival, I'm going to make sure that people know that in my title and my description. So people are always changing their listings. So if you're just looking at one short-term rental platform like Airbnb, at one point in time, you're really not getting a holistic picture of what the short-term rental market in your community might look like, which obviously means that it can be very time consuming to try and address on your own. So we're gonna dive a bit more specifically now into what the short-term rental market in Colorado looks like. So I get up in the morning, I chug a glass of water because we live in Colorado and hydration is important. I make myself my tea and I usually ask A-L-E-X-A -E to put on NPR. And yesterday, I can't say her name because she's in the room with me, but yesterday there was a brief story about the housing market in Colorado. Um, and so probably comes as no shock to any of you that like many other places around the country, housing market here in Colorado is insane. Um, the story discussed how many of those homes are being purchased by people who list their current address as being an out-of-state address. So maybe they're moving here, maybe it's a real estate investment, but either way, they're not current Colorado residents. And what's the easiest way to make money back on some of those real estate investments? Renting it out. And specifically, short-term renting. It is just true. It's the most lucrative way to make money on a property that you own, especially here in Colorado. But that transition from long-term housing stock to short-term housing stock is very dangerous, particularly here in Colorado. It's also highly contentious. Um, you know, feel free to let us know in the comments if this is something you're experiencing as well. I wouldn't be surprised given the conversations that I've had in Colorado. Um, and as we saw on an earlier slide, the short-term rental market is only growing. It's grown 15x in the last 10 years. So next slide we're about to flip to, we knew that we had over 50,000 short-term rental units or short-term rental listings from that slide earlier. Slide we're about to flip to shows the number of listings in Colorado. Um, so as a reminder, this number is always a little bit higher than the short-term rental units number, but still in Colorado, as of this month, we have over 88,000 short-term rental listings across the state. And again, we took this number in May from the data that we have here at Granicus, and we're past peak ski season, which is when we see a ton of fluctuation in the short-term rental market. So this is 88,000 as of May, a week or two ago. And that's not just, you know, Summit County is obviously a major player in our short-term rental game, given the concentration of ski resorts up there. I am certainly uh, someone who has leveraged short-term rentals in Summit County before to ski with friends, ski with family. Um, but short Summit County, as you can see, with just over 19,000 short-term rental listings, um, that actually still represents over 11,000 short-term rental units. So people in Summit County who are renting out their homes are renting them on multiple platforms to try and increase the number of bookings that they have, increase the occupancy at their property, because obviously that's going to drive up their revenue at the end of the day. And that's a pretty dramatic um, ratio, but even in a place like here in Denver, city and county, where there are over 5,000 listings, that is still representing over 4,000 short-term rental units. Either way, message is pretty clear that the market here is growing very rapidly. So what do we do? There's been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate across the state about how we go about addressing that rapidly growing short-term rental market. So do we put a cap on short-term rentals? Do we increase permit fees? Do we ban short-term rental operation by non-resident owners? Do we put a total ban in place or just a moratorium until we can catch our breath, understand the market a little bit better and come to a solution, figure out a way to address the issue. And there are representatives from municipalities all over Colorado on our call today. So um, you've all chosen slightly different routes based on your community's desired outcomes. 
So we've got another quick poll here coming your way. And so I will let us pull that up. Here we go. So what is your top priority when it comes to addressing the short-term rental market? Um, again, you know, here in Colorado, we are concerned about the preservation of long-term housing stock and the availability and ability for people who live and work in our communities to continue to do so. Um, we are a major tourist destination, clearly, for a number of reasons. And we want to capture as much tourism revenue to the greatest extent that we can. Um, we know that we're all very proud to live here. There's a reason that we live in Colorado and we want to protect the integrity of our communities. But we are also acutely aware that we're approaching this conversation from a lot of different perspectives. Um, you know, planners here in Colorado might want to get an effective and affordable short-term rental ordinance in place in the first place or update an existing one. Um, code enforcement, they might want to ensure that those regulations are being followed um, and that they don't wanna spend their entire day addressing parking and trash issues at short-term rentals. So there we go, as we can see, housing availability and affordability is a huge concern, safety, huge concern. Um, we've got customers in finance and tax collection departments who are concerned about driving that revenue as well. Um, so we are seeing this from a lot of different perspectives and we want to make sure that all of those perspectives are heard because everybody's coming to the table with valuable information that we can carry forward with us. So a few quick stories about our partners here in Colorado. Um, so, but more specifically about what we're doing in Colorado right now before Graham takes it off with the software here. Um, these are a few of those communities that we're working with. Again, this is just a handful of the communities that we work with in the broader Mountain West. Um, and only a few names of the over 400 host compliance customers that Granicus has spread across North America. So taking a look at this list here, if you're not leveraging your colleagues and neighbors knowledge and experiences in other cities and counties, we highly recommend that you do that. We can always put you in touch with some of those other community advocates and leaders who are as concerned about the short-term rental space as you are. Um, you face a lot of the same challenges uh, like, for example, a one of the stories that I've heard from a Colorado customer is a, around the lack of transparency when it comes to some collection agreements at the state level. Um, so housing availability and affordability is huge. And as we saw that shift, obviously a major piece of that tax revenue is potentially being collected at a higher level. It's not done locally. And so one of our customers at the beginning of the pandemic actually was uh, receiving those monthly checks from Airbnb or from VRBO um, to get their tax payments that they were owed. And at the very beginning of the pandemic, maybe March or April of 2020, the short-term rental listing platform actually reached back out to them and said, actually, we don't have a check for you this month. You actually owe us money. And the reason being was, you're getting those checks as soon as the bookings take place. You know, I'm paying for a short-term rental as soon as I book it. And so the short-term rental listing platform is collecting that tax then as well, even if my stay is months away. And so part of the issue of the pandemic, when a lot of people were getting their trips canceled, trying to get those refunds, was that those listing platforms had already given out that tax revenue to some local communities. And then they flipped it around a month later and said, actually, you owe us money now because we had to refund all of those stays. And so there's just not a ton of transparency to know where those tax payments are coming from and who in your community has paid those taxes. There are often collection agreements with major listing platforms, but as you saw earlier, there are over a hundred listing platforms. So that's not capturing all of the revenue that your community might be owed at the end of the day. Um, so that is a big piece of the conversation that we hear about a lot, particularly in Colorado. Another safety related concern um, is about fire safety here in Colorado. So obviously a very, very big issue. Um, 
and guests are not always aware of local fire bans, local fire restrictions. Um, and we work with communities in Colorado where fire bans are not necessarily communicated to guests at the short-term rental. And that is a major safety concern because we know how dangerous that is. Um, even if someone visiting your property is from another location in Colorado, the area that they're visiting from might have a completely different fire risk than they're used to. Um, so they might not be thinking at all about throwing something on the grill outside, starting a fire uh, in the fire pit outside. Um, so we have a couple of communities that have to actively be addressing those, particularly during uh, fire season when there's a very big risk here in Colorado. We know that that is unfortunately all too real given the number of fi uh, fires that have popped up around the state in the last couple of years. So fire safety is a big one, obviously not unique to Colorado. We have a lot of customers in similar communities who are addressing those issues, but it is certainly something that we hear come up over and over again. Um, things like bear safety as well. People might be visiting not aware that they can't have their trash out all week long because they've got some really hungry neighbors who want to go out and, and have a free dinner, you know? So there are a lot of things that as a resident, you might be aware of, you might take into account, um, but guess that short-term rental properties might not. So those safety concerns and the way that we communicate them is very important. And again, we're trying to approach short-term rentals knowing our not desired outcome necessarily, but what's most important to us. You know, are we most concerned about safety? Are we most concerned about revenue generation and tax collection? Are we most concerned about the availability and, affor and affordability of housing? And so everybody has those slightly different perspectives and we want to carry those with us as we try and address that with regulation. And so with our software, the goal is to be able to identify the precise physical street address of every short-term rental property in your community so that you don't have to spend the time doing that on a daily basis, weekly basis, whatever the case may be. Again, the short-term rental market is changing all of the time. So another question here about some of the challenges that you face in addressing short-term rentals. And while you're answering that, you know, the goal, our goal is to step in and help you understand the market, understand potential revenue loss, community impacts. And we really want to help streamline your processes and make them more efficient and effective to allow you complete transparency into the short-term rental activity in your community. So um, a lot of things that we help our customers address here. Um, and we will let Graham, just a second here, dive into the actual software demonstration once we wrap up our challenge question. Betsy, um, I did want to ask one point. So I know our logo slide is just a, a segment of our, our customer base. Um, and I was hoping you could chat to, to smaller communities who might be um, concerned about folks who work within Colorado. What does pricing look like for smaller communities? And um, I know we work with a few metro districts. Could you just give a, a few examples or insights into how smaller communities can leverage it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so our pricing um, and the way that we work with customers, you know, we're working with customers of all shapes and sizes from places that actually have zero short-term rentals because they might have a ban in place and want to constantly make sure that there are no new short-term rentals popping up to communities that have, again, like Summit County, over 11,000 short-term rental units, almost 20,000 short-term rental listings. So all shapes and sizes, but at the end of the day, the way that we customize that pricing is based on the number of actual short-term rental listings and units that you have in your jurisdiction. So if you have 15, if you have 50, if you have 500, your pricing will change based on that number. Um, and so we work, as Will mentioned, with jurisdictions of all shapes and sizes, including some metro districts, including some HOAs here in Colorado. And the way that we customize that pricing and customize what they need is to select some of the modules from our software that will help them achieve their short-term rental goals. So there's not you know, Graham is going to talk about the software in just a second here, and there are a lot of different facets of it. Um, address identification is the only requirement to work with us. 
on host compliance. So that's the one that he's going to dive into right now. But awesome. it looks like some of our challenges, cost and time associated with enforcement, that's definitely huge here in Colorado, especially in our smaller communities where everybody is wearing multiple hats um, and everybody has a lot of different priorities that they need to stay on top of. And then also aligning that ordinance with community goals, that makes a ton of sense. So Graham, without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen here in just a second after you start giving a, an overview of address identification. Yeah, so as uh, Betsy mentioned, you know we do have a number of solutions and they're really tailored to uh, meet you where you're at in terms of your short-term rental program. Uh, so address identification being the core, understanding the market, knowing where all the short-term rentals are. And then based on your regulations, we can work with you and some of our other modules to help kind of streamline those processes. So I will take us through a high level overview of address identification, and then we can get into some questions and answers. And so what I've got pulled up on my screen is our address identification dashboard. And so this is the, the main screen that users will see when they log into the software. Uh, you'll note it's entirely web-based, meaning you can access this whether you're working in the office or whether you're working from home. And we do provide individual logins for every user. And there's really no difference in whether you needed 100 logins or five logins. Uh, you know, it is an enterprise license, so you can have as many different users as required. Now, the dashboard itself is looking at the live short-term rental market in your community. And so at any point in time, staff can come in here, they can see the total number of short-term rental units. Again, those are the, the physical properties themselves. Any new rental units that have come up in the last 30 days, and we're getting to that 75 number by pulling in all of the active advertisements, both short and long-term. So one thing we do know is that even though they're advertising on Airbnb, uh, there are people that will list for a minimum of 30 nights or more. And again, based on your definition of short or long-term, we can start to split those markets out and identify just the short-term rental listings if that's what uh, you're interested in. From there, our team takes on all of the identification work. So we, uh, we're using our demo account here. So we're not actively identifying all of the properties. Uh, as a general rule, we'll have you upwards of 70% identified before you go live. And from there, it just increases. We work with some very large communities uh, with over 12,000 short-term rental units and they're upwards of you know, 95, 96% identified. And again, this number will fluctuate as new people come into the market and as other people drop off. Once we've identified all of the short-term rentals, the next piece is really working closely with you during implementation to understand what is a compliant short-term rental in your community. And once we know that definition, the software can automatically start to identify those compliant short-term rentals, the long-term rentals, maybe they're compliant by default. And then most importantly, all of these non-compliant short-term rentals. And this could be like our working list of properties that we need to bring into compliance. Some of the other areas that we uh, are monitoring for, whether it's an entire home rental or a partial home rental. Partial home is typically associated with um, an owner being on site and there may be renting out a bedroom, uh, you know, more of the traditional uh, Airbnb version of uh, you know, short-term rentals versus the entire home where the owner is gonna be absent and guests have free reign of the entire property. Uh, some other criteria, the property type, whether it's a single family, multifamily, and you'll notice this little unknown category. So this is really anything that doesn't fall within the standard definitions. Uh, some of the short-term rental platforms have really been promoting unique stays. So things like tree houses, yurts, RVs, uh, camping in someone's backyard, uh, in Idaho, there's a potato you can rent. And one of the more recent ones that I saw was you could actually spend the night in an airplane hangar. So, you know, there's lots of, lots of unique stays, but they don't generally fall within the single family, multifamily. And they may not be uh, rentals that you want to allow within your community. Some of the other data points, uh, bedrooms, bathrooms. Uh, bathrooms, uh, I didn't realize were so important until I started working with a few communities that were on septic. 
Um, you know, some properties on septic, they weren't designed to have 20 people in and out every weekend. Uh, so that became a, a major data point for some of our customers. And then bedrooms, uh, a lot of places will have occupancy limits, you know, a standard definition, two people per bedroom, plus an additional two guests. Uh, but this makes it really easy to identify that, you know, two bedroom condo that's saying that they can house 16 people. The rental units and listings over time uh, will help you get a good idea on any sort of seasonal trends within your market. And if you're collaborating with anybody from tourism, uh, you know, being able to understand times of the year where the market drops off, maybe we do want visitors coming in during the off season. So we want to promote the community during those time frames, And then during peak season, maybe we need to start anticipating some additional enforcement costs, right? Uh, bringing on some additional code enforcement or people to work evenings, weekends, when we know that there's going to be uh, a large number of people visiting the community. The minimum night stay requirements. Uh, this is fairly common in a lot of communities. You'll see most people are advertising in this one to seven night range. Uh, but we, with even our uh, demo account here, we do have some listings that are advertising for 30 plus nights. Uh, so again, these could be those compliant long-term rentals. And then the last chart that we have on our dashboard is looking at the identified units over time. And one of the things I always like to highlight is uh, this is strictly looking at the identified units within the live market. So once we've actually identified a property or they take down their listing, uh, you never actually lose any of that data. So we do keep a full, I like to think of it as a master database of every short-term rental that's ever been active in your community. Uh, and we do keep all of the historical information related to that property. Uh, so you, this is strictly just looking at um, the map view up here. And so the map itself is uh, fully interactive. You know, it works like a Google map. Each of these icons on here represents those short-term rental units. Uh, and then they're also color coordinated and shaped based on their compliance status with local regulations. Now, at any point in time, if we wanted to toggle off and just look at the non-compliant ones, we can simply do that from the legend here. Uh, but this also allows us to zoom in fairly closely. And we can also switch to the satellite view and get a real close look, or even drop the man into the street and get a street level view at the property itself uh, before code enforcement or anybody has to actually go out and visit the site. Uh, clicking into any of these icons will take you to what we call our rental unit record. Now, this is a deep dive on a specific short-term rental property. Here we can see the identified address. We can see this property, it's active, meaning it's available for rent currently. Uh, it's been identified. And in this case, this property is compliant with local regulations. Now, this page is summarized in two different sections, uh, the listing information on the left. And so this is all of the information that we pull in automatically from the short-term rental platforms. And then on the right-hand side is the rental unit information, so specific to that short-term rental property itself. Now, as we're pulling in all of the information from Verbo in this case, uh, we are capturing all of the listing photos that are associated with this property. And we also provide the match details. So how we've actually identified and confirmed the address for this property. Um, one of the th areas that we do is we geocode it down to the most likely address. Uh, and then we have a team of human analysts that go through and find matching third party sources that confirm the location. So in this case, they were able to match the listing photo on the left uh, to just the street view on the right. Uh, and then they also match some uh, criteria from the home to the actual assessor information and similarly use the building layout here in order to confirm it again via Google Satellite View. Um, so at any point in time, you don't need to just take our word for it that it's a short term rental. Uh, we provide you with all the uh, explanation for how we've actually determined the location for that property. Below that are some of the listing details that we pull from the platform. Uh, if you ever did need to link out to the site itself, we provide that right up top. But now we're getting into some of the uh, data points that are most important for our communities. Uh, things like the price per night when it 
it comes to recovering tax which can be often omitted and something that is kind of changing within the market is shifting more of your costs to the cleaning fees where uh, those don't automatically get taxed uh, and then some of the additional information things like minimum night stay requirements max sleeping capacity uh, and as we're pulling in all this information, we are taking full page screenshots, time and date stamp of the listing itself. So you can imagine if you've reached out to somebody, they tell you they're not renting out their property. Uh, you don't really have anything to go off of if they've taken down their listing in the meantime. Here we've got a complete history of this property going all the way back to when it was first identified in 2019. Uh, back when HomeAway was HomeAway before it merged with Verbo. And these are available for you to print, download at any time. So again, if someone does say, I'm not renting out my property, uh, you've got time and date stamp screenshots at your disposal just to provide as supporting evidence. Now up on the right-hand side, uh, again, related to the property itself, as we're identifying the properties, we can combine this with uh, either your assessor information or if you're maintaining your own uh, property ownership information in Esri GIS, uh, we do have the ability to integrate with those and start pulling in things like the parcel number, the owner name, the owner's primary mailing address. And a lot of communities now are also moving towards uh, having their registration or license number both posted um, online as well as you know having that record in the system and so we are also able to verify uh, you know from the registration that we have on file if that's the advertised number on the actual listing itself beneath that is our timeline of activity and so this is where we start to capture some of the different market behaviors of different uh, short-term rental hosts so going back to my example, maybe you reached out to somebody and they took their listing down and then two weeks later, they thought they're off the radar. So they decided to repost it. Uh, we are able to capture that sort of behavior. So we can see when this listing was removed, when it was reposted. Uh, we can also capture things like documented stays. And this is when uh, we know that somebody is booked, they've paid, they've stayed at that property. Uh, and we've taken it one step further than just looking at the calendar and that we actually pair reviews to those calendar blocks in order to confirm. And it's really the only way you can say with 99.9% .9 certainty uh, that a booking or a stay has occurred during that time frame. Uh, with some of our other modules, uh, you know, the hotline, any complaints that have come in related to this property also appear on this timeline of activity. And with our compliance outreach module, any letters uh, that were communicated to the short term rental operators, in this case, a second uh, warning letter, uh, this also is automatically captured and associated to that short term rental property itself. And Another piece here is uh, our comment section, which you'll see throughout the software. Um, as Betsy alluded to earlier, there are a number of departments that short-term rentals tend to touch, you know, whether it's planning, whether it's enforcement, whether it's finance, uh, and they all kind of have different purposes in uh, looking at the short-term rental market. Uh, our comment section allows a great way for staff to be able to leave notes, related to a specific property. And at any point in time, users can come in and they can see uh, the user that left the comment, the date, the time, and any notes that were left related to this property. So maybe code enforcement was called out, they dealt with a complaint at that property. At the same time, planning's in the process of reviewing their application and also finance is trying to recover some uh, fees that are due before they go out. So uh, another way for staff to be able to collaborate uh, all in one platform. So I'll jump back to the dashboard. I mentioned earlier that when we capture the information, you never lose it. So again, we're looking at 75 active short-term rental units. Uh, from our dropdown, we can navigate to our rental units table. And this is that master database of every short-term rental property. So within this, you can see right off the bat, we've got data on 189 uh, short-term rental units. So properties that have been rented out at some point in time as a short-term rental. And within this, there's a number of different data points. It can be a little bit overwhelming, uh, but for each rental unit, so for each property, we are capturing about 150 different data points related to that short-term rental. 
Um, again, based on your roles, we know that people are going to be looking for different information. And so we allow you to kind of have that flexibility to build your own custom reports. So you can add any of the different data points that we've captured on the left here, or you can remove any of the ones that aren't relevant for your job function on the right. And the added benefit here is, you know, once you've created your report, you've dragged and dropped and rearranged your columns. Uh, because everybody has their own user login, whatever report you create on your end isn't going to impact you know, what another team member is looking at. From here, uh, we can add, remove filters. We obviously have the quick search. So if you know the address for the property that you're looking for, you can certainly type that in or the owner name. Uh, any of the invisible field, this is where the quick search will, will search for. And then if there are reports that you're generating on an ongoing basis, uh, we do have this predefined filter combinations and we can set up these custom reports for you. So you can come in here and quickly just select the report type and have it generate uh, for you. So in this case, if we wanted to look at those 75 active entries, we can put that one in and maybe we just wanna look at those non-compliant ones. We can add a filter. And once we've generated our report, this is ultimately your data. Uh, you do have the ability to download this at any time, uh, whether you wanted to download it to share or work offline, uh, or whether you wanted to download it so you can upload into another system. Uh, some of our communities will upload the longitude and latitude as data points within their GIS. That is all things that you can do uh, right from within the software. And so I will, uh, I will stop there before I you know, get too deep into the, the different reporting capabilities and, and some of the other uh, modules within our software. Um, but if you are interested in you know, learning more about how this could help your community, we're more than happy to uh, provide a, an in-depth demo going forward. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Graham. Thanks. Betsy, you've got one last slide. Uh, so just as a kind of a summary of uh, the different modules that we do have. So address identification, we uh, monitor over 70 different short-term rental platforms. And we do this on an ongoing basis, pulling in all new listings and doing the identification work, which is often uh, you know, the cost and resource intensive process for trying to get your arms around the short-term rental industry. Um, from there, we do have our compliance outreach, which is that letter uh, sending module. We do have online and mobile enabled permitting and tax collection and uh, the 24 seven hotline for residents to be able to make complaints. And the last piece is rental activity monitoring, uh, which is for anybody that has limits on the number of allowable nights or uh, when you're looking to ensure that you're collecting all of the local taxes related to uh, an individual operator's revenue potential. Awesome, thank you, Graham. Uh, I just wanna run through our contact information. So if you do wanna follow up, you can, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, can we go next slide? Yeah, so if you're not familiar with Granicus outside of what we've just discussed today, we do have a number of other solutions for local governments, everything from agenda and meeting management over to websites, uh, digital forms and services, so uh, please check out the website. Uh, we have plenty of success stories and referrals to share with you um, across Colorado. Go next slide, next. Yep, so uh, like Graham has mentioned, we can really help at any stage of your short-term rental journey. So pre-ordinance, we can certainly help figure out what's right for your community in terms of your approach to short-term rentals. Uh, and then post-ordinance, we can really help with efficiency in terms of making enforcement move uh, quicker with less staff, less time. Um, so yeah, it really, I know this group is, is not a group that already has a short-term rental solution and that's really no problem at all. We're, we're happy to help wherever you are in the process. So um, if you do wanna contact us, you can contact Betsy directly via email. Um, I believe Sharon will share this information with you after the, after the fact. So yeah, please feel free to reach out. And uh, I think we can open it for questions now. Let's see if we have any in the QA. Not that I can see yet. So if you're on still, please feel free to add a question to the chat or the QA. But um, Graham, I'm curious, 
for folks who might be interested in revenue collection, could you just do a really high level cover of kind of what that process is and, and why it's so easy? Yeah, absolutely. So within our uh, rental activity monitoring module, um, we're obviously capturing those documented stays that you saw on that rental unit record. Those all have a certain number of nights and a dollar value associated with them. Now, we can't get directly from the platform how much has actually um, been generated by individual short-term rental hosts, but at host compliance, we do have uh, historical information on earnings, uh, which is something unique to, to our solution, which allows us to kind of model uh, expected earnings and then also a maximum earnings. So we provide three tiers of revenue estimates and it becomes very simple when people are reporting revenue to compare that with their earning potential. And for anybody that is seemingly underreporting within our within our solution, we do have the ability to initiate an audit. And so you can collect the documentation required in order to verify their earnings and their tax remittance uh, against what we're showing in the system. And where this really helps is uh, now you can focus your efforts on those ones where there actually is revenue potential. Uh, one of the biggest things that is gating a lot of communities is the time and effort that goes into auditing uh, every short-term rental operator and only recovering from a few of them. Really, our solution can help you kind of pinpoint those high earning properties that haven't reported any revenue and ensure that you're capturing uh, from those ones and not waste your time auditing the entirety of the market. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. I know uh, that's a priority for many Colorado communities. So just wanted to make sure that, that we address that. Uh, it doesn't look like we've had any questions come in. So great job, both of you. It was very comprehensive. Um, but please feel free to follow up with us after the fact. Um, follow up directly with Betsy or contact SIPA. Sharon, I, I think we're good. All right. I can pass it back to you. Perfect. Well, thank you, guys. Um, if you want to return to this webinar to view it again or share it with a colleague, keep a lookout um, for the post webinar email with the link to the video, which I'll be processing later today, and it'll go up on our YouTube channel. So if you want to just look for that, you can find it there. Additionally, we want to make these webinars as relevant and informational as possible. So we would be appreciated if you could take a minute and fill out the brief two question survey following this webinar we'll send out. Um, it helps keep us on track being able to provide you with information you are most interested in. To close, I want to thank you all for being with us this morning, and especially want to thank Graham and Betsy for their great in-depth presentation about short-term rentals and compliance and enforcement. Webinar Wednesdays will be taking a break for the summer and for our user conference that's happening in September. We'll return in October with the rescheduled one that we had from April with resultant. Subscribe to our monthly newsletter for news and upcoming events and useful information. And like they said, if you have any questions, reach out to either Beth or myself or any of the folks at Gernicus. Thank you all and have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Bye.